I just, I don't think that I have it in me to knit someone a whole cardigan and then see it accidentally go through the wash and get ruined and then forgive that person. <laughs> so, hi, hello, my name is Ali. I'm an independent graphic designer coming to you from just outside Toronto. And this is my channel where I talk about what I'm knitting, how it's going and what it's costing me. And today I have a brand new finished object to show you, but I also have some sort of um, new again, born again, finished objects, if you will, um, as part of the Fix It Fall knit along. And I also have a new cast on to show you. And I'm pleased to report that I do actually have a reading update for our Off the Needle segment at the end. So if you love books too, stay tuned for that. Good morning. Hi. Um, so I feel like I would just like to acknowledge that I filmed this video two days before the US election. So if you're watching feeling like she seems a little too chipper, that's why. Um, this is me checking in from Wednesday morning. And um, yeah. I guess I just want to say that if you're here for some reprieve from the world, um, I'm glad that past me <laughs> was uh, prepared enough to record in advance to give you that because I definitely don't have it today. Um, but hopefully this can be um, a bit of an escape for you for an hour. And um, I know I'll be doing the same with some of my knitting podcasts. So that's all. This is how you also feel. I'm here with you. Before we get to that though, we are drinking my usual Sloan Classic Earl Grey out of a mug that, listen, I <laughs> I know that we are past Halloween season now. I know we're firmly into November, but it just felt wrong to not give my last Halloween mug its little moment on the channel. So this is my little Hocus Pocus cauldron from Slow Sunday Ceramics on Instagram. Go check her out. But I just think this mug is a delight. And did I drink tea out of it while watching Hocus Pocus this year for Halloween? Yes, I absolutely did. And as for what I'm wearing today, this is my classic rib by Pernille Larson. This is a pattern that accommodates up to a 58.5 inch bust, which, you know, I would like to see that size range go a little bit further, please. You're so close to the 60 benchmark. Just, just if we could just get there in a little more, that would be great. So I finished this sweater, I believe about a year ago now, and so far I've worn it 16 times. So since the sweater cost me $104 in yarn, pattern, etc., that puts us at a current cost per wear of $6.50 Canadian, which converts out to about $4.65 US. So obviously that cost per wear is gonna keep going down over time, but so far I feel like 16 wears over last year, that feels pretty good to me. I feel like that means that this has made a solid place for itself in my wardrobe. So I think this one was a good choice. Now on the subject of ones that were maybe less practical choices in my wardrobe, you may remember my poppy tank top. This is one that I knit before I started my channel, but I have talked about it before. I've worn it on my channel. It's also what I decided to wear to Knit City Toronto this spring. But here's the thing. I think those might be the only two times that I wore it. Like, I think that it is so cute, but it's also, it's very high maintenance. Let me tell you, those straps, I, I tried to figure out a way to knit them that they would just stay nice and flat. I like added a little bit of ribbing around the edges. It was not enough. They become a curly disaster. Like they have to be like manually pinned out to dry perfectly flat every single time. And despite the fact that I love it on its own as an object, I think that I, I found it tough to wear in multiple ways. Like one is just kind of a fussy thing to have on. You know, it kind of, I felt like it required a sticky bra. I felt like, not that I felt precarious in a way that it was suddenly gonna like fall off of my body, but just in a way where, do you know, like, do you ever just get that feeling where you're just like, aware of the clothes on your body and like you kind of have to be like careful about how you move in it in a way that's not like difficult but it's just like your clothing is like in your brain while you're going about your day in it you know and for me this top was just that and I did not love it enough for it to get a lot of wear in spite of that and I think that I also just found it kind of hard to style within my personal style just because it's so girly that I found like I had to like really try to like counterbalance that with other parts of the outfit to still feel like me in a way it just it just was like hard for me to wear despite like how many trial and tribulations there were in making this this was like a disaster of intarsia bobbins like it was just a whole thing but so when I finished this and my friend Jan was like obsessed with it and was like oh my god will you please make one of those for me oh my god I love it so much it's so perfect it's so beautiful at first I was like no this is fine I made it I'm sorry and I'm not making it everyone because it was terrible but over time you know as months went by and as I wore it like a couple times eventually I was kind of like I feel like maybe I am not the forever home of this garment. I feel like maybe I've just been taking care of it on its way to where it's supposed to be. And I would like to present to you where it's supposed to be. This is my friend Jan wearing it 
look how beautiful and perfect and stunning it is on her. She has a much girlier style than I do too, so it fits in so well into our aesthetic. And like, look, look at, like, I would never have even thought to style it like that. Like, Jane just like knows how to do these things. I don't know, it looks perfect on her. This is clearly where this was supposed to go. So shout out to my beautiful friend Jan, the new owner of the Poppy Tank. And yes, she is always taking beautiful pictures like this, so I'll pop up her Instagram if you wanna go check that out too. All right, now let's get into our finished object. Okay, so you may recall that I have been working on Christmas stockings, they are complete. So this is the Christmas stocking by Claire Slade. This is a free pattern, though like two days ago when I was going to do the very finishing touches on this, I went to find the pattern just through Ravelry again because there's just like a web link. And I had had it downloaded, but I was like, oh, it's just faster for me to get to it this way. And it said pattern no longer available. So I was like, oh God, did I download this at some point? Like, please tell me I downloaded this because I'm so close. Don't not tell me how to finish this. So I did find a copy that I had downloaded thank God, but it might no longer be available online. I'm not sure, maybe it's just moving somewhere else. I, if you're interested in knitting it, I would definitely go check out the Ravelry page and see if you can find something now, if it's been updated. But like what rude timing, <laughs> especially like the time of year that I feel like most people are gonna be wanting to knit stockings. Like I, what, what, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why that happened, but anyway, thankfully I did get the direction that I needed. So it's a free pattern, but is it an available pattern? unknown. So since it is a Christmas stocking, of course this is a one size pattern, so I'm just knitting it as is, though I think that the yarn that I got is a little bit thicker than the weight that it calls for, but I don't feel like these turned out ginormous. So if you like like a really really big Christmas stocking with a lot of room for stuff, I would say you could even get away with knitting this with like an extra bulky weight and it would be just fine because this is like a bulky weight yarn and yeah I don't feel like it's too big, so. So I knit this out of the Bernat Fluffy yarn, which I picked up for $10 at Michael's. Um, and like I was saying in my last video, this was my first experience like buying a cheap yarn just from the craft store because it was the first time that it wasn't like a garment that I'm gonna be wearing where I really feel invested in like the quality of that and what are the properties of that fabric and how is that gonna feel to wear and what's that gonna do for me like this? This just needs to mostly sit on my wall. So I had very different criteria. Now, unfortunately, in the last video, I was talking about how, you know, I bought this ginormous ball of yarn for $10 at Michael's. And in fact, it was free because I bought it with a gift card from a past return, blah, blah, blah. I got to like here on these stockings. I was knitting them two at a time. So both of them were to like here and I ran out of yarn. <laughs> and I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Because this ball of yarn is actually, well, let me, let me go get it. This ball of yarn is huge and it's still huge because I had to use so little of it to finish these up and it was so painful. Now, thankfully I managed to again, still use this gift card to buy this $10 worth of yarn. So they're still free, but at what cost? Like I have this ginormous ball of yarn that, like I said, I this is not a type of yarn that I would use for most projects. So like, what, what am I doing with this? I, I could like almost make two more stockings out of it, but now as we know, not quite. Like, I could do like shorter versions, like just remove a repeat maybe of the cable, but like, A, I don't need four stockings. B, why? Why is it so big? It seemed like an asset that it was so big when I thought it was gonna be the right amount. And if I had known that I was gonna have this problem, maybe I would have just made it one cable repeat shorter, but like, I don't know. I don't know if I would want them to be smaller. It was just, it was so close to being the right amount of yarn, but not quite. So like when I got to the finishing touches, you know, at the end you do this, um, you make a crochet chain, which was new to me. We're gonna come back to that. But I was like, okay, well at the bottoms of these crochet chains are pom-poms. And I was like, these are gonna be some puffy pom-poms. I'm gonna make pom-poms that use so much yarn. I tried and yet, and yet. But so last time I was talking about how, you know, as I was holding it up, there were these yarn overs that the pattern called for that were really showing up as like holes in this rim. And I was like, I was thinking this was just to like help show where the fold line's supposed to be, but I feel like it's really showing more than I want it to, but maybe this is for something later in the pattern that I just haven't looked at yet. Ding, 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 that was in fact the correct answer because those holes are now where the crochet chain is sort of woven through the top so that it has a little spot to hang from. We have our bow, we have our little tassels with our little pom-poms. Very cute, so I no longer regret those yarn overs. <laughs> And yeah, making the crochet chain was interesting to me because I have never crocheted anything. I mean, I guess that's not strictly true. The most I've crocheted is using a crochet hook to fix um, dropped knit stitches. <laughs> so I guess there's that very small version of a crochet technique that I do know all too well. But I had to look up a tutorial to see how to do the crochet chain. And I 
like I take it that if you're a person who crochets, a crochet chain is a very like simple, basic foundational skill that is probably extremely second nature to you. I found it so awkward and <laughs> difficult. Like I'm just sitting there with my crochet hook and the yarn and trying to do what it looks like they're doing in the tutorials where it sort of gets wrapped and then like pulls through like the other, like the loops that they've already created in this kind of seamless way. But like every time I would pull it down to try to get it through that loop I had made, it, it always felt like the hook was too big for the hole and I had to kind of like use my other hand to like open the loop a little to pull it through but like isn't the size of the loop created by the size of the hook so why is the hook too big for the loop like I it was just not <laughs> it did not go smoothly for me I would kind of try adjusting different things and like sometimes I could get it to pull through like I could just kind of get the tension right I think this is also why I've sort of briefly tried knitting continentally and I just cannot get the tension right in my left hand. And I feel like that's the same problem I was having with the crochet situation. It was just a real struggle. And then sometimes I would feel like I had found a rhythm and it was working, but then I would look at my chain and the chain like suddenly looked different. Like, I don't know if I was like wrapping the string around the wrong way or something, but like things kept changing. It was, it was never a dull moment. It was like working well for me, but looking wrong, but then it was looking right, but working wrong but working up very uncomfortably like it just it was just like a process <laughs> I had to make a total of 200 centimeters of it I think that was about 90 inches or something it just like took longer than it seemed like it should <laughs> so is a prolific crochet career in my future I do not think so but I mean maybe if I figure out crochet I can also figure out knitting continentally and I know a lot of people talk about English throwing being way less efficient than continental, which, you know, yeah, looks like it. <laughs> like when I compare them, I do think that's true. That doesn't really motivate me to learn continental. Like I'm not really over here, like how do I mass produce as many knit garments as possible? In fact, like I feel like knitting is an expensive enough hobby as it is, <laughs> you know? I don't think I need to be like plowing through projects at two times the speed. But the part that does make me go, maybe I should learn that is that I think that continental knitting as far as I've seen is actually better ergonomically and this is a thing that I think about but not enough that I'm like really good at doing like the hand exercises you're like supposed to do when you're knitting and like taking breaks like I I think to do it sometimes but definitely not as much as I probably should and you know I learned knitting from my grams who now doesn't knit because it is painful on her hands so this is a thing that I'm aware of this idea of like my knitting career being kind of on a clock that at some point is gonna run out based on the health of my hands and the ergonomics of what I'm doing so part of me is like it would probably be really wise of you to learn to switch to continental but on the other hand when I've tried it briefly in the past like it's just once you're good at doing it one way really comfortably it's really hard to switch to a version of it that feels painfully slow and awkward and clunky it's like i can get this done so much better right now and of course in the long term it's not best but in the short term it's so painful so i don't know i think at some point i probably need to do that but it just never feels like the time that i want to do that you know <laughs> But so in addition to figuring out the crochet chain, which, you know, is it the most beautiful or consistent crochet chain that ever existed? I don't think so. I think some of those loops are a lot bigger than others, but it does do the job and you don't see it very closely anyway. This is also my first experience making pom-poms, which um, I don't think I did a perfect job of that either, but I would say that they look, you know, roughly like pom-poms. Are they the most perfectly round pom-poms you've ever seen? No, but I don't think that's in the Christmas spirit. <laughs> so for these, I, you know, I looked up a couple different YouTube tutorials and there, there are things with like cardboard templates. The one that I ended up doing was just holding up my hand like this. I might've done three fingers, I don't know. I just wrapped the yarn around my hand a whole bunch of times until I had kind of like a loop and then like wrapped the end of the yarn through the middle to make kind of like a butterfly shape. And then just like cut the like, wing if you will of the butterfly and then once I had done that cut then I did another trim around the outside to kind of even out the lengths of the strings and then I just like flipped it up. The first one that I made turned out much bigger <laughs> than I wanted it to. The pattern calls for a I think four centimeter diameter pom-pom and mine was like it was like large and I was like okay I think that this is um somewhat overpowering on these stockings so I kind of re-flattened that one and like did a big trim around the outside and is that four centimeters? 
I feel like in my head that's like about four centimeters, but it looks much bigger than in the pattern photos. And no, no, I think that is much bigger than four centimeters. I don't know. That's what we've got. These are the pom-poms that we have, you know, and I like them. So this pattern is knit from the cuff down, as you may have figured out based on the fact that I ran out of yarn here. Um, <laughs> but they're also written to be knit on a 5.5 millimeter needle, but I did size up to a six millimeter because I famously knit tightly. Maybe that's something else that Knitting Continental would fix. I don't know. And I was knitting these two at a time, but on separate circulars so that they weren't like all of this bulk times two on one set of needles. And I really liked that method of working them up. I really liked that I didn't hit the end of one and then go, okay, time to follow all those instructions from beginning to end all over again. It was much nicer to just be like, okay, now I'm just gonna do the toe directions again and now I'm done. So I do think that that's a method that I would definitely consider in the future for things like this. Now I cast these on September 26th and I finished them just a couple days ago, I think November 1st, which means that these took me over a month, which is definitely longer than I expected them to. I was thinking I'm knitting these in big yarn on big needles and you know it's, it's basically like knitting two sleeves right that's, that's basically what that is I was not expecting it to take so long but I think that for me this project really dragged because of the all over cables and the fact that it was I think three out of every eight rows of the repeat is cabling so you're cabling pretty frequently and when you are cabling you're doing several different cables in a row and different kinds of cables so this really required a lot of attention this was not a great like TV knit. Like I did do that, but I also ended up making a lot of mistakes that I then had to go back and fix because my attention was divided. So these were kind of a higher maintenance project than I expected them to be. And I'm so glad that I have them. I'm so glad that I made them. I think they're so cute. They're gonna be so good up on my wall leading up to Christmas. But I feel like they've kind of put me behind on where I thought that I was gonna be with my fall knitting plans, which is only an issue to me because I was really hoping um, to be gifting my sister something for Christmas. And now I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh no, is my sister getting half of that for Christmas? Interesting. So yeah, I think just because, you know, recently I've just been knitting things that are kind of all stockinette or like all ribbing, like very sort of simple repetitive things. I just really underestimated how much the complexity of this stitch pattern was going to affect the speed that I knit them up at. And um, unfortunately the same goes for my sister's Christmas present. So uh, wish me luck. Also, the last time that I talked about these, I was mentioning how some of the cables kind of turned out strangely, like this cable. See how it just doesn't kind of like sit tightly one on top of the other as well as like these ones do. And I was kind of fretting about this because it happened on both sides of the stocking. So I couldn't even be like, oh, I'll just display this side. But then as I was doing the same portion of the second one, I kind of had the same thing happening. And I don't know, I don't know why. It also happened around the same part of both stockings, which you would think like, oh, well then that must just be something in the pattern. But that doesn't actually make sense because you're just following the same repeat like several times down the leg. So nothing actually changes in the pattern at that point. So like what, <laughs> what did change? Is that just the part of the pattern where I get bored of it and zone out and do something funky? I do not know, but I've concluded that like in the overall effect of these, like if I had not pointed that out to you, like would you have noticed that if these were hanging on the wall? I think probably not. And I don't think that I will. I think that the um, sort of introduction of the heel turn, like once this part was added in and you can see the way that it kind of like mucks with the cable pattern for a little bit. I feel like once that happened, any lack of uniformity up here kind of gets camouflaged a bit by that. I feel like the funky cables are much less noticeable to me as part of this entire finished object than they were when it was just the legs. So I'd been talking before about maybe trying to like pop in a little stitch from the inside to just kind of like push that in, like tuck it in a little. I'm not gonna do that. I think these look great. I'm not gonna bother. I hate weaving in extra ends. Looks good to me. I will pop up a picture once I have these up on my wall. You can see where these have been destined to go. And yeah, these are my Christmas stockings by Claire Slate. Okay, now moving into our sort of reborn finished objects because these have already been a finished object on the channel before, only in my Everything I've Ever Knit video because I knit these before I started my channel. But these are Dad's Thuja socks. And these are part of the Fix It Fall knit along, hashtag Fix It Fall K-A-L, if you wanna join in on Instagram or in the comments. But if you've been here for a while, you will know that my dad loves nothing more than a knitted wool sock, but we've experienced some difficulty because here's the thing, dad and I are kind of purists about wool socks where we want them to be all wool and no nylon but we have learned the hard way that that often results in 
felting because there's just enough friction inside of like a warm winter boot that from him walking the sole of the sock gets enough friction and heat that it actually does felt itself and as a result when the ankle of the sock used to be here it ends up being like here because his foot ends up kind of stealing from the leg of the sock as the sole of it gets felted so what used to be you know a normal length sock that was this long and you know went up a good distance of his calf once his heel was happening here instead suddenly they're like kind of ankle socking so he asked me if i could possibly add an extension to his socks and the good news with these ones is that I actually had plenty of the same yarn left over. So this pattern is the Thuja Socks by Bobby Ziegler. This is a free pattern that comes in one size designed for like an average men's foot. And I knit this out of Filcolana Peruvian in the color Dark Chocolate Heather. So I had bought enough of this yarn thinking that I was going to make one and a half pairs of socks out of it, one and a half because I'd bought the same amount of yarn in a different color and I was planning to make a third striped pair with the sort of half socks quantity left out of both of them. But it turns out that there was a different fate to be had for the remaining wool from these socks. And I have now knit an extension on them. So you can probably see where the extension happens because these socks have this um, sort of, I think it's a four by one broken rib. And up here where the cuff originally was, <laughs> it switches to a one by one rib. And then suddenly the normal stitch pattern resumes because we decided that wasn't gonna be the cuff anymore and we added a new cuff. So I had asked dad originally like, okay, these are knitted cuff down. So if we're gonna be going cuff up, this is not something where I could easily just sort of frog that cuff and then keep going. Like to make it look really clean would require like surgery. And I still don't think it would look that clean because since the knitting is switching directions, you would still end up with a little bit of a jog. So would it make a big enough difference to you that I should do that? Or do you really not care and you just want them to be long enough? And he was like, I really don't care. I just need them to be long enough. So I just went in and just picked up stitches all around the top and then just kept knitting. So you do have this sort of um, phantom rib cuff here <laughs> and then the rest of the leg continues. So I added, I think that's about six or seven inches there. So now hopefully, hopefully these are actually the correct size for dad. So like I said, I did not have to buy any new yarn to do this, but when I bought that yarn originally, I ordered it online from Galt House of Yarn and it cost about $8 Canadian per ball. So I think that's like six-ish dollars American. And these were knit on a four millimeter needle. And now this was before I started consistently sizing up my needles when doing patterns, when I realized that I'm always knitting small. So I think that these also may have fared better if I had sized up a needle, because I think that we have a combination here of not just the felting, but also that the socks were maybe stretching a little bit more than they were intended to, to fit his feet at all, because I think they probably came out a little bit smaller than the pattern was intending for them to. But they were very warm. He was very happy with that. And he'll be even more happy now that they have a longer leg. So this is our second finished project of Fix It Fall since last time I showed my intarsia sweater with the new collar on it. I did find in knitting these, you know, it, it didn't look super promising while I was knitting it. Like I picked up all the stitches and I was knitting going, I really hope that blocking fixes this because it just, the new part just looked so much more like scrunched and ridiculous. Like it, it looked like maybe I had like missed some stitches when I was picking up because it just looked like this was not nearly a wide enough leg. It just, it was just so obvious. <laughs> But blocking complete, I mean, I feel like that's like from a distance, you can't see that at all, right? I feel, I feel like blocking saved the day. They look very uniform. It's only if you look close and you find that seam that you can tell. So very happy with that. I also found as I was knitting it up, it just felt like it took so much longer <laughs> than I thought it was going to. But I mean, I guess it, it makes sense. I mean, it's like six or seven inches of a sock. Like, like it really just felt like I was knitting like, a whole new pair of socks like I had to knit like a whole other leg like that's basically the amount of knitting that I was doing so it felt time consuming in that way I did do them two at a time at least so I didn't have to do one and then start the other from scratch because I that always feels worse in my opinion so and and I think it actually only took me like a weekend's worth of knitting like a weekend where I got to knit a decent amount to do it but it just I was just like how am I still doing this like I just felt like I was sitting there kind of forever but so I'm pleased I'm pleased that that's done and I'm also reminded why I needed a fix it fall knit along to coerce me into doing this because like it doesn't even feel like a new finished object it took quite a while it wasn't it's not like the most fun kind of knitting to do you know so I hope that if you have something like that as well in your pile waiting for you that the fix it fall knit along can help you get it done too because I'm very glad that this is 
over. Now dad can have a socks back. And I feel like the fix of all knit along is going pretty well for me because I also have a second pair of dad's amended socks and <laughs> you can see looking at these ones, I did not have enough extra yarn from what these socks were originally knit out of. I did have a little bit. So if you look closely, you can actually see it because so as not to throw dad under the bus. He does very much care for his wool socks and treat them appropriately in a way that makes me feel very good knitting things for him. But there was one accidental incident <laughs> where these made their way into the dryer. So this portion is somewhat felted. He, when this happened, he gave them back to me so that I could try to reblock them using my sock blockers. And listen, I had to like wrestle these socks onto the sock blockers. Like they were small. They had like really shrunk up in their felting, but getting them fully wet again, I was able to kind of just barely stretch them back onto the sock blockers. And that definitely helped and kind of stretched them back out to a wearable size. But it means that you can see exactly where I picked up and knit more using the original yarn because this part's not felted and this part is. And you can really see the difference in the definition of the stitch pattern there. So I had enough yarn to, on both of them, add sort of maybe an inch and a half with the original yarn here. And th this was another advantage of doing the two at a time because it meant that I knew exactly how much of the yarn that I could use on both of them. I didn't have to try to measure when I'm halfway through one, okay, now save that much to use on the other. I just got to knit until I ran out of yarn and then I switched to another color. <laughs> so you'll see that when I ran out of yarn, I switched to add in a bit of the dark chocolate heather from those last socks because I still had more of that left. And then when I ran out of that, I switched to this blue color. It's, it's not as contrasty against the brown, so it's less obvious from a distance than from this color to this color. But this is a bit of a yarn that I got from my friend Amy when she was doing a de-stash of this Santa Scarn Double Sunday in the color number 6580. So I still have a bunch of that left. This is the only thing that I've done with that yarn. It was almost two full balls, so there's lots left. But I thought that would work well enough to kind of finish off these socks after I ran out of the Dark Chocolate Heather Focalana Peruvian. And this yarn is, I believe now, discontinued. It's from We Are Knitters, and it was their Echo Lana line. But last time I went looking for their Echo Lana, they didn't seem to have it anymore. Anymore, but it was sort of their like rustic natural undyed line. So this was a sort of like warm gray color that I really liked. This is also the same yarn that I knit my quilt jacket out of. And I, I think that I made these socks thinking I was going to just knit it out of leftover yarn from that project, but in fact ended up needing to buy more because the, I mean, we've heard about this happening to me multiple times today. This is a thing that happens to me. <laughs> so again, this was the case where I was like, okay, dad, I can make these longer for you. I don't have enough of the same yarn. So how much are you gonna care what yarn they get finished with? Like, do we need to like design something where, you know, I'm going out and specifically buying like a cream colored yarn. So we're doing like a Roots Cap and Sock kind of aesthetic. So it looks like really intentional and deliberate. Or are we just making the socks longer? And he was like, we're just making the socks longer. <laughs> so I decided to just use what I had available to me in my stash already. And I tried to make the blocks feel at least like intentional. You know, they're kind of big enough and sort of similar in size that hopefully it looks roughly on purpose. But I mean, mostly that's just going to be up a pant leg and no one's even going to see it. So dad's just going to be thrilled that they're long enough. I guess I should probably tell you what these are. <laughs> so these are the Grizzly Socks by Anna Rodchenko. This pattern costs $4.75 US and I've gotten good use out of it because I've actually made a couple different pairs of these socks before. I, I quite liked it. It's very simple. It's I think a twisted rib. So they were just, they were very simple to knit up. These were knit on a four millimeter needle. And again, this was before I learned that I should start sizing up my needles. This was actually the first pair of socks that I ever knit. So I had not yet learned that lesson. If I had upsized my needles, we probably would have had less of a felting issue, but you can still see for sure like, the bottom very much felted. Um, the ankle used to be here. That's sort of the original gusset and this ended up being more like here as dad has worn them. So the good news is that these socks are very well loved. They get a lot of wear and dad's gonna be very excited to have these back, I think in time for snowmobile season. I will say when I was picking up stitches on this one, it was much harder to pick up stitches on this one just because of how felted this was that it became very hard to even see what I was doing, what I was picking up, what part of the stitch I was picking up. like. I thought that it would be simple to be like, well, it's a one by one rib. So it's very clear to see like how many stitches you should have picked up. But just at the cuff when I was actually doing it, I was like, I don't know. And I think that these blocked out well, but I do think that the top portion is short two to four stitches from what the leg originally was. I think that kind of at the front, like where, because the sock is sort of flat as you're knitting it at the front, and at the back edge, I think that I missed a ribbing repeat. Like there's, 
there's a purl stitch at the front here that looks like wider than the others. And as I was knitting it kind of, you know, a few rows deep, I was like, huh, <laughs> I think, I think I missed a little bit, but I do think that blocking was fairly, fairly forgiving. And I think you can, t it does look like it gets a little bit skinnier, but I think it's pretty good. Good enough. Good enough to keep dad's feet warm. That's the important part here. So yeah, that is my progress so far on Fix It Fall. That's our third item down. Not bad. Okay, so with our finished and refinished objects out of the way, it's time to get into my new whip, which before I get into that one, I have to say, Kim, my beloved sister, if you are in the vicinity, please leave because you will ruin Christmas. Not that my beloved sister actually watches my YouTube channel, but her nine-year-old son does. So Chase, hi, hello. If you put this on before bed, I love you. You can't watch this one with your mom around, sorry. So if you saw my fall knitting plans, you will know that I've been planning to make the Minu cardigan for my sister for Christmas. So once I finished the Christmas stockings, that was my next cast on. And <laughs> like I said before, I've been finding that cables take me a lot longer to work up. Shocking, who could have predicted such a thing? So I'm feeling a little apprehensive about my Christmas plan. Kim might get half a cardigan for Christmas, but we're gonna do our best. So I'm working on the Minu Cardigan by Louise Rekoff. And this is a pattern that's size inclusive up to between a 58 or 62 inch bust, just depending on how much of the intended positive ease that you wanna have. The pattern costs 650 euros or about $10 Canadian. And I'm knitting this out of the Cascade 220 Superwash in the color Deep Sea Coral because Here's the thing, I don't typically love superwash for garments for myself. I just, I don't think that I have it in me to knit someone a whole cardigan, a whole cabled cardigan, and then see it accidentally go through the wash and get ruined and then forgive that person. <laughs> so I decided that it's in the best interest of my family dynamics if I knit this out of Superwash. So I ordered this from a Canadian yarn shop called Le Lendi Scut. It was basically the only online place that I could find that was in Canada to avoid duty fees that actually had enough of the color that I wanted in stock. So I ordered 10 balls of this, which cost me a grand total of $152.45 Canadian or about $119 US. So total project cost, once we add in the pattern cost, that brings us to $163 Canadian or about $119 US. So I am really hoping I can get this done in time for Christmas because I don't wanna to have to buy her another Christmas present <laughs> after I already bought all this yarn. Like, yes, this could then just become her birthday present, but I would just love to not have to front the cost of a whole other Christmas present right now. So first thing I cast on a swatch for this one because I felt that this was an especially important one to swatch since I'm knitting this out of superwash yarn. But here's the thing, superwash grows. So I was kind of thinking, okay, I knit tight, but superwash is gonna make things bigger. So maybe this is a case where I actually should knit with the needle size specified in the pattern. And those two things will sort of balance each other out. And that is exactly what happened. So my swatch came out pretty exactly the size it's supposed to. Now. I'm not convinced that in the overall scheme of an entire cardigan that the superwash stretch effect isn't gonna get kind of magnified from what it is in the swatch. So I am thinking that I still need to kind of be cautious about the idea of it becoming too big. And I think that I am going to do multiple mid project blocks, particularly as far as things like sleeves so that I know where things are currently at before I finish things up or keep knitting too far. But based off of the swatch meeting gauge, I decided to knit the size three in the pattern. And I also, in this swatch, if you look closely, you can see I kind of botched the cable pattern. Um, both of these two cables on the outside, there's two different cable twists, one down there and one up here. And they're actually supposed to go in the same direction. And in this swatch, you can see that I did them in the opposite direction, not because that's what I thought I was supposed to be doing, but because I was experimenting with doing um, cabling without a cable needle, which I think I've done a little bit before, but not for a very long time. And I sort of had to re-remind myself how to do it. And I was thinking, a lot of cables in this sweater. Maybe that'll make it smoother for me than the Christmas stockings felt. But I I kind of got it backwards in my head when thinking about these stitches needing to come to the front. I wasn't really thinking about it correctly when I was thinking about in doing it without a cable needle where your needle goes in when you're kind of skipping over the stitches that you would be holding to the front or back. Like if you're supposed to be holding stitches to the front, your needle should be going behind the work into the back of the stitches that are past it. And that was just a level of conversion that my brain did not think to do. So I actually did what was essentially holding them in the back for the first twist. And then by the second twist, I'd given up on the idea of not using a cable needle. So I did it normally and then went, huh, why doesn't that look like the pattern? But you know what? This is what swatches are for, both checking your gauge and learning how to do the stitch pattern, I guess. But yeah, I concluded that I, th I think that if this were a pattern where the cables were kind of constant, 
then getting used to doing it without a cable needle would be worthwhile. But in this pattern, the cable portions are actually so long in their sort of straight continuation before it cables that I actually feel like it's not very intrusive to use a cable needle. And I, at this point, still find it much easier to use a cable needle. So I think that for this project, that's what I will continue doing. Because I think in this project, I can go like an hour or more before hitting a row with cabling. So it just doesn't feel necessary to me to be trying to avoid picking up and putting down a cable needle, especially once I'm using it, I'm using it many times in that row. Like, I think that that will just make the most sense for this project. So I just cast this on on October 25th and let me show you what I've got so far. Okay, so I'm literally like in the middle of a row, but let me show you the, the correct side. So this is what we have so far. So you can see I have figured out how to do the correct cabling, see how see how they're twisting in the same direction and they look all nice and pretty. So this is the back. Of course, it's a little bit smushed up on my needles right now, but so this, I imagine this is on my back, not my front, but you can't see my back right now. So this gives sort of an oversized shoulder effect, like this is going to come down kind of past the top of the shoulders and then the sleeves will pick up from there. And on the one hand, I'm like, wow, I feel like this is really coming together. You can really see the pattern starting to happen. That's so nice and satisfying. I also feel like this is so far away from being a whole card. <laughs> that I'm like, can I get this done by the end of December? Hard to say, but we're gonna give it an honest effort. You may also notice that I have so many stitch markers on this. Um, and this was basically a choice that I made in hopes that this would help me to knit this a little bit more absent-mindedly. So what I have basically done is because this pattern, it's doing the same cable in every sort of column of cables, but every other one, is offset, kind of like a vertical version of the way that bricks are staggered. So it means that one cable is kind of at a different point in the cable repeat than its neighbor is. So what I've done with my stitch markers is I've used circular stitch markers for like type one of the cable and then triangular markers for type two of the cable. So you can see how this one, it's in its like long open phase and this one's in its twisty phase. So as I go along, okay, circles, long open one, triangles, twisty phase, circle ones, long open ones, triangles, twisty phase. And then in between there are these um, little pearl columns, which get, you know, sort of de facto delineated by the circle and the triangle. Now over at this end, I ran out of, by which I mean, I think over time I have lost <laughs> to try to find a lot of my round stitch markers. So some of these are the sort of light bulb safety pin ones instead, which I don't recommend for this purpose. They are kind of just the right size on these needles that sometimes the small part actually ends up being what's on the needle and then it prevents things from sliding nicely. I also have to kind of always like flick them out of the way when I'm like flipping between knits or pearls. So I, I don't love those. Those are kind of annoying. I need to try to find a better replacement from those. But I do find that when I'm working on this, it does really allow me to just glimpse at my chart once at the start of a row to go, okay, are we just maintaining the status quo of what we've been doing? Or are we changing something in this row? Or are we changing something in this row? And once I know that, once I've looked at it for half a second, the rest of this is giving me enough information to go off of. And of course, just like looking at your knitting, reading your knitting is going to give you a lot of this. But I do find that the stitch markers is kind of saving me that sort of half second of calculation every time I get to a new one and kind of preventing me from accidentally ending up in a flow where I just keep doing something where I go, oh yes, this is the one where I'm doing this kind of half fisherman's rib and then realizing, oh no, I did it across the rest of the row and I was supposed to stop, you know? <laughs> so I do think that they have been helpful in that way. It does make it a little bit um, jingly <laughs> when you're like putting it away and pulling it out, but I do think that that has been useful to me. What has also been useful to me, and I, I'm, I'm gonna cover a lot of this, this is a paid pattern, but you can see the gist is that I just printed out the chart and I laminated it in packing tape. And then I'm using my little um, binder clip to mark the row that I'm at because I had shown when I was working on those stockings that I made one of these little cheat sheets for that as well to make it easier to work the cable pattern on the go. And I was using a paper clip to point to the row I was at, which was working well when I wasn't trying to bring it with me. But once that went in a bag, it was really easy for the clip to get sort of jostled around and nudged up or down. So I was finding that whenever I put it in the bag, I was having to kind of like, take a picture of it to keep track of where it actually was in case it gets moved, which is just not ideal. So when I made this one, I found this binder clip and was like, ah yes, this, this will do a better job of what I'm trying to do. But so I do, I find it really helpful when I'm working on something that has a chart like this, particularly where it's not a chart that I have to like read stitch by stitch every time, you know, this is not like an intarsia color chart where I'm like, okay, and then this one, we add one more square of the color here. And then on this one, we add one more square. Like it's not that. 
I just need to look at it for a half second to know what I'm doing this row and then I'm good to go. So just having this little cheat sheet where I don't have to like pull it up on my phone again or even like pick up and unlock my phone again to look at it. Like that process takes more time than just looking at it. So to just have it sitting there beside me is really helpful. So I made one of those for it currently working from and then I think at some point when I start working on the front and there's increases and decreases there's a different chart for that as well so I've also made a cheat sheet for that one so we're all set to go this pattern is also my first time doing a half fisherman's rib so this part here you can see is the half fisherman's rib and then when it's doing the actual cable twists it switches to just being a regular stockinette and then goes back to being the half fisherman's rib and this is my first time doing any sort of what i'm gonna call like a puffy <laughs> stitch like i'm putting this in the same category as brioche in that way i've never done any of these things and it's just so like satisfying i just love how it looks it just looks so nice and squishy it feels nice and squishy i really like it i feel like it gives this really sort of luxe appearance and really defines the cable so nicely now of course all of this comes at the cost of how time consuming it is <laughs> so you know we're, um, we're doing our best out here. So I do find that between my, you know, 1 million stitch markers and the sheet sheet that I made for myself, it is easier to work on mindlessly than if I hadn't done those things. But it does still definitely take up more brain space than like an all stock net project. And the way that I see this most is when I catch myself making mistakes. So sometimes if I'm working on this and watching a more involved show or trying to carry on a conversation, particularly if it's a row where I have to remember that something is changing so I'm not just continuing with the status quo from like looking at my knitting. It's very easy for me to get into a flow of just doing what I did the last row and then going oh I need to unpick half this row because I was actually supposed to do something differently. Like that's the sort of thing where I find that the non-mindlessness of a pattern like this gets me. It's like you cannot multitask in the same way while doing the parts of a pattern that are not just following what you've already been doing. So it, it'll be interesting to see if I end up picking up something a little more mindless to work on alongside this just for those times when I can't do that. That was what had initially motivated me to start doing um, the fix a fall knit along and fixing up dad's socks because these are a much more mindless stitch pattern. But I'm not sure how much more on my fix a fall list kind of fulfills that particular criteria. So I don't know, next time I'm here, who knows, I might have cast on something all new just out of need for stuck in it or a standard ribbing. So yeah, this is my progress so far on the menu cardigan, which, you know, feels like it is something, but so very far from being what it needs to be. So stay tuned on whether this happens for Christmas. Okay, now Copper has come to join us <laughs> for our- Oh, he's gonna be, he's gonna be just out of frame. So Off the Needles is a segment where I talk about things that are sort of in the like creative hobby realm, but are not knitting specific. And traditionally that has included a lot of books, but in my last video I was talking about feeling like a real slump. I hadn't had any really solid reading updates to give in a little bit, and I felt like it had really hit kind of a brick wall. Copper's still here, just slightly out of frame, if you can see me like petting what appears to be nothing. But so I'm pleased to report that I actually have not one but two books to talk to you about, because I think my reading slump has finally been broken. And I think we can credit that to The Guest List by Lucy Foley. So this is a book that when I was visiting with family a few weeks ago, my sister was like, I just finished this book, here you go, you should read it. And so this is like a, a thriller. And I would say that I read thrillers like once in a while, like it's not my go-to genre, but once in a while I really am like, ooh, that sounds very appealing to me. And I think that, like kind of thinking about this in the context of the reading slump that I was in, I think that I tend to go for these when I'm having a hard time getting into my usual reads. I think that they're kind of different enough from what I normally read without being too scary. I definitely couldn't read horror novels. I couldn't deal with that. And also while being, I mean, usually they're very sort of like fast paced page turning. So I think that for me, it's a really good genre for sort of jump starting my reading again when I feel that momentum waning. So I had a great time reading this book. Oh, I also should mention every time I talk about books in the channel, I do put links to them in the description if you're looking for them. I put um, affiliate links to bookshop.org where you can buy them online in a way that still supports local bookstores, which I think is really cool. So the premise of this book is basically that this like very glamorous couple is having a very glamorous wedding on this sort of secluded island in Scotland, Ireland. Ireland and someone dies like the book opens on like people are screaming there's a body and then like rewinds to build up to that moment to like what happened who might have a motive to kill what different people here and who actually ends up dead in the end and who did it and it was just it was really good it's very sort of like atmospheric with like this spooky foggy Irish island it was just very like compulsively readable so if this is the kind of thing you tend to like definitely recommend this one and then the second book that I have to talk about the next thing I read was Everything We Never Had by Randy Rabe so this is a book that I talked about when it was originally just an acquisition on my channel and I talked about loving his previous book Patron Saints of Nothing and this 
did not let me down. Like I loved this book. Like I, I think that in the first like 40 pages, I wrote down three different quotes. <laughs> like when I was originally talking about this book, I went over the premise, which is that it sort of follows four different generations of boys in this Filipino American family from the boy who immigrated to the States on his own at the age of 16 down to his great grandson when he's 16. And I was commenting at the time that like it covers all four of these perspectives. The book is only like 260 pages long. And I was like, this sounds like the kind of sort of family epic that's usually like a 500 page book. So I'm very curious to see how he does this. And like, I'm here to tell you, he does this with like poetic precision is the only way that I can think to describe this. Like his prose just does such a good job of just like distilling, like nothing is wasted. He is so good at communicating so much through so little or through something that is small but you can really see how much it represents in the larger scheme. So before when I was talking about his writing and patron saints of nothing I was describing it as kind of a like literary feeling YA and I couldn't really remember specifics of like what made me want to say that I just remember that that was like the gist that I gotten and in reading this next book from him like these things that I'm saying, like I'm reminded, this is why I felt that way. Like it really does just have this very like literary writing, but meshed with the sort of compulsive readability of YA. And I loved reading it so much, I like flew through it. So like, just, just to give you a little example, this is a quote that I highlighted from page four. <laughs> we were only four pages in and I was already like, oh, I need to write this down. So this is from the perspective of the great grandfather. So this is the one who at the age of 16 has immigrated to the US by himself. And it says, on mornings like this, when he's near the world, but not in it, near the others, but not with them, near himself, but not quite. When the fog has seeped through his skin and settled into his bones, and he no longer knows where it ends and his breath begins, having already filled his lungs with too much mist, he wonders if he should have listened to his nanang. Maybe leaving wasn't the only way. Just this idea of on mornings like this, when he is near the world, but not in it, near the others, but not with them. I just, there, there's a thing that I love so much about reading where you for the first time read something that puts into words a feeling that you recognize so deeply, but have never seen expressed before or not expressed in such a perfect way. And I just feel like, like who doesn't know the feeling, especially if you've ever lived in a big city, the feeling of being very much surrounded by people, but being very apart from them and still sort of in your little internal world. Like this makes me think of, you know, early morning walks to class in university, downtown Toronto. Like I am dead asleep still. I'm very much in my shell, but I'm passing by thousands of people on my way to where I'm going. Like it's just such an apt way of capturing that feeling. And I think that's the kind of feeling that Randy is so, so good at, both at capturing things that are deeply familiar to me and it's like oh my god suddenly seeing that expressed is such a cool feeling but also capturing things that are not personally familiar to me that are concepts that I am aware of and I've definitely heard about before but that he really captures in a way that really I think helps you to fully understand these concepts that are not necessarily things that you've experienced firsthand. So there's an example of that there's a part again this is only on page 14 <laughs> so we're not we're not far in and I'm deciding so many things but it's sort of explaining the Filipino cultural value of Ote and so for context, at this point at the beginning of the book, the grandfather, so the second oldest generation from this story, is moving into the house with his son and his grandson at the start of COVID because he's been living in a retirement home. And so they're trying to take care of him despite the fact that they have a very sort of like strained family dynamic. And he writes, I may not be his biggest fan, Enzo says, letting Chris off the hook, but if the other choice is to let him stay somewhere where he might catch a deadly virus, then yeah, sure, I guess I'm okay with it. He sighs. Utang Nala Ob, right? Utang nala ob, a debt from within, from the heart. It is a debt you did not ask for and will never pay off, but must always try to. It is a gratitude for the ancestors who brought you into existence, for the family who raised you, for the community who helped you in ways direct and indirect, visible and invisible. It is acknowledgement that none of us are alone. Like, that was one paragraph. And I feel like that just so succinctly encapsulates a concept that you know like I've definitely read about and been exposed to in various capacities but never seen expressed in a way that's quite so concise but moving at the same time and I think we can even break that paragraph down more like just this one sentence it is a debt you did not ask for and will never pay off but must always try to like I just he's such a good writer just just read his book <laughs> just so good so confirmed patron things of nothing was not a fluke of me loving his writing. I am such a fan. If you haven't read anything of his, highly recommend. 
And lastly, for off the needles, I want to talk a little bit about writing. So if you've been here for a bit, you know that writing is one of my other interests and working toward publication is something that I've been doing for a little bit, but I've been sort of at this weird stalled point where I've been querying a manuscript, which means sending it out to agents, hoping you get an agent. And that is very much like a waiting game. So I was doing a bunch of sending out queries, but then you're just kind of like chilling. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I need to start working on a new one in the meantime. And I've done a couple rounds of sending out queries on that first one, because as a general rule, you don't want to send like every agent you possibly could all at once, because you want the chance to amend things in your query package if you're not getting the results that you want. And in one of these query rounds, I'd gotten two requests from two different agents for the full manuscript for them to read. One of them still has it. And then about a week ago, I got a rejection from the other one, which I have like mixed feelings about because I mean on the one hand I know that trying to get an agent like it's like such a shot in the dark because like it doesn't even just have to be that your writing is like quote unquote good enough like it also has to find the agent who is like obsessed with it like uniquely obsessed with your work in a way where like they want this to be the one of only a tiny handful of things that they are championing for that entire like year two years through like the publication process of a book and continuing to support you for your future career. So it doesn't just need to be that they think it's a book that they can sell. It's a book that they have to like want to reread like several times as they go through this process with you. So like, is it surprising to get a rejection? No. And like the part that is really positive to me is that the rejection was very encouraging. Like it was very complimentary of like the voice and the style of my writing. And the problem was just not being sure how to like market the book, which is also not surprising to me because this is my consistent problem <laughs> is that I like to write young adult contemporary and kind of on the like lower key side of like normal everyday stuff with the plot with stuff still going on but in a way that I just find really hard to turn into like a snappy marketing hook that's a very easy like what's your book about one liner that translates really well into marketing and this has actually been one of the things that has been I think stalling me out on really digging into the next manuscript that I want to work on because I had an idea and I outlined the whole thing and I spent a lot of time thinking about it but now I'm looking at it like through the lens of this rejection going I don't know that this one is more marketable like I thought that this second one was more marketable than the first one because I had done my first round of queries with a different manuscript we'll call it manuscript number one. Manuscript number two is the one that I just got this rejection on. Number three is the one that I like should be writing now. So number two I tried to start with a hookier concept after having had the same issue with number one and I think that while number two definitely has like hookier bits to it I think that it's there's still kind of too much complexity in like I still would struggle to be like like if you ask me what's it about I would struggle to give you like a one sentence answer what it's about that captures like the hookiest parts of it like I think it just requires a little too much explaining and so I've been trying to think about this in working on the third one but I just fear that like this third one's not hookier than the second one so if I'm having problems with the second one I don't think this is gonna solve that. So I think that I need to figure out a way to tell the story that is like at the heart of what I have outlined for manuscript number three, but kind of transpose it into a different set of circumstances that does make for sort of a hookier premise, if that makes sense. Like the core of the characters can be the same. The core of the themes can be the same. The setting that I spent a lot of time thinking about and fleshing out can be the same. But I think I need to kind of find a hookier package to wrap all of that into. And I'm just like having a really hard time figuring out what that is because that's just not my strength. <laughs> like part of me is like, should I just start writing like retellings of other things because this is consistently like my issue with writing like the idea of a premise of, like what your main plot will be is by far the hardest part for me like I love the actual drafting once I know what I'm writing but coming up with what to write is hard is really hard for me and it's even harder to come up with a what to write that is easily distilled into like a one-line marketing hook that is going to help it actually make its way out into the world and I've spent a lot of time trying to learn how to do that well for the stories that I have written, like to try to make sort of the like punchiest way of describing the manuscripts that I have written 
And I think that that definitely improved their prospects. You know, I don't think that I would have gotten two full requests at all on manuscript number two if I hadn't done that. And I just still have more queries to send out on number two. So it's not to say that like all hope is lost. I just feel like you can only dress up a quiet story to such a degree that I think that maybe I need to just start with something a little bit more attention grabby from the get-go. And it's just a matter of coming up with something that fits that, that still feels true to the kind of story that I want to write, you know? So that's kind of the current challenge, but I have sort of rededicated myself to spending dedicated time on it every day. I started November 1st in the spirit of like NaNoWriMo. I'm not actually doing NaNoWriMo. I've done NaNoWriMo many, many times in the past, but because I don't feel ready to start drafting because I don't yet know what story I'm actually writing, but in the spirit of NaNoWriMo, I have decided to spend time every single day working on the book, like kind of thinking and brainstorming and trying to come up with what the premise of this book is going to be. Hopefully that's done before the end of the month. Hopefully it doesn't take me a whole month and then I can start actually drafting. But I don't want to just start writing because I feel like I could just infinitely write manuscripts that come to me intuitively that have no marketability. <laughs> that's what I would just do until the end of time. So if my goal is actually publication, I think I need to kind of tweak something in the starting phase of my projects. And it's just a matter of not letting that make me not start at all because that's the hardest part. But so that's why I've decided to kind of spend some like dedicated time, like at least half an hour every day, kind of thinking about this, planning for this, brainstorming, trying to sort it out. So <laughs> wish me luck with that. All right, that's all I've got for you today. I would love to know if you are participating in the Fix Up All Night Along, how's it going? What are you working on? Have you finished anything? I'd love to know either here or on Instagram if you use hashtag fix it fall K L. And if you're on Instagram, please tag me at Allison Rowan to make sure that I see them because I would love to know how that's going for you. So thank you so much for coming in with me today. If you'd like to be here next time, I hope you'll consider subscribing if you're not already. If you are though, you are my favorite and I'll see you next time.